because I've asked Pastor Steve Guptill to bring the word today. Um, and come on, yeah, he he's an awesome, awesome guy that I'm just so thankful for. He's actually our small groups pastor. He's also our musical director. He's the guy up here like speaking in microphones when y'all don't know it, telling everybody what we're doing next and all that stuff and uh, range of stuff. It's a lot of stuff he does behind the scenes that you don't know about. Phenomenal, phenomenal man. But beyond that, I want to just tell you that he is um, a guy that, um, as I thought, thought about this topic, I said, this is one that Pastor Steve needs to bring because he shared with me some personal things in his life where God has just done some amazing, miraculous things. And so I honestly believe that this is an ordained time with a specific message. So today we hope that you'll open your hearts and ears to hear not just a general word, but we ask that the Holy Spirit would take his, these words and speak a specific word into your heart because God's going to do something eternal in some lives today, everybody. Right, everyone? So before, without further ado, I want to, you guys to help me welcome Pastor Steve Guptill. Come on, give it up for Pastor Steve. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Pastor, Whoa. for the, the kind words, my man. All right, well, good morning, everybody. I'm Steve Guptill, and um, it's great to be here today. A pastor a couple weeks ago said, Steve, would you mind bringing the message? I said that uh, we're going to go for it the best we can. Um, so uh, really, guys, just wanted to, you know, I do work here as a, on staff as uh, our small groups pastor, so I would encourage you, we're in the middle of a great semester here, fall of 2016. So if you haven't hooked up with a group, please, uh, I can connect you with a group leader myself. And uh, my other role here is a music director. You actually heard four of me today. <laughs> I just was. So it's four Steves for the price of one, thanks to digital technology. It's a miracle. No, it's not a, it's not a miracle. It's actually me in my recording studio recording my guitar. So uh, we, we enjoy that. that um, you know, guys, we were thinking about small groups. Small groups are real important to me, and I consider kind of the worship team here, guys. What you, what you see up here is really a small group, and I, and I say this, it's a small group that happens to bring their instruments on Sunday morning. It really is. Pastor Dwayne and Karen doing a great job with that. But uh, we were in a um, small group on Thursday. We rehearsed Thursday nights, and uh, we were talking and, and praying together, and we have a great time together. And... Um, Kind of the question was, and, and Dwayne was bringing the devotion, it was kind of like, how do we, how do we as people of faith, shine our light? You know, how do we, um, how do we show, how do, how do we live this Christian life? And, and what does our faith really do? What is the effect of our faith? And uh, so we were talking about that, and uh, they were saying, well, what's it like to kind of ha not have faith? And they all <laughs> looked at me for some reason, but they know, they know we, uh, Dawn and I uh, came to faith a little bit later in life. I was 29 years old, and my Dawn, who... Uh, my wife Dawn, who's with us today, and my daughter Elizabeth is here too as well. And Dawn and I came to faith in 1993, and really out of an unchurched background. And um, so I was, I was thinking about that question that, that, that was posed in our small group. Guys, again, I mean, just the, the dynamic of a small group is amazing. So guys, if you're not involved in a small group, please. And this is, they really helped me out this week. So, you know, the question is, what, what, you know, what was that like? And I, and I thought back to, this, this, this story came back to, to me. It was 1985, and I was in undergraduate engineering class in, um, in, Brooklyn, uh, in Bronx, New York, Manhattan College. And um, so I'm down in, you know, really, realistically, guy, that's pretty hard. So I was just trying to get my degree. And if you would have known me back then in the 80s before we came to faith in 1993, you probably would have... Uh, uh, if you were to talk religion to me, you might have gotten a negative response. <laughs> Let's put, we can say, it's safe to say that. And so, so engineering's pretty hard, guys. All I basically did when I was a kid and growing up through college, I did my education and I played music. And that's, that's what I love. And uh, so I would be in the city uh, studying engineering, very difficult. And on the weekends, I'd drive back up to our Hudson Valley and... Uh, and, uh, you know, play the job. And in fact, today, I want to, before we get too far, we do have Facebook Live here, our friends and family from Hudson Valley, New York, Poughkeepsie, and Fishkill, and Wappingers Falls. Y'all never heard of it. <laughs> I was wondering, why are they still up there? Come on down, y'all. It's, it's, it's uh, nice down here in the south. But uh, my sister from Boston, my brother Pennsylvania, anyway, welcome, guys, before we get too far in the message. But uh, so I was in engineering class, and uh, I had to take one more elective. And this was actually a, a Catholic college, so they did require a religious elective. And I was looking through, you know, again, I'm not too interested in religion, looking through, what, is, what am I going to do? Guess what, guess what the course was, guys? Introduction to the New Testament. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, no. And on top of that, the Bible was the textbook. So I'm not too thrilled with that. That was back in the 80s. And uh, so we were talking about what's it like to, to you know, to 
to have a you know a faith perspective that's that's not too strong. So needless to say, I, I wasn't too interested in that class. I can't. The funny thing was though, we did study Jesus's miracles and the Sermon on the Mount. And what I'm going to be preaching on today is Jesus's miracles. So 32 years in the future. But what I did remember about this guy, and I wanted to uh, just uh, so this was this was a teacher. It was the mid 80s. He looked like the 70s, the early 70s. You know, in the, in the 80s, we dressed sharp. We had skinny ties, you know, and we, we, we were dressing a little bit better than we did in the 70s. But this guy had, you know, bell bottoms, shaggy beard. But the interesting thing was, as he taught, I didn't pay attention, of course, but there's one thing I did notice, and he really was sincere about whatever he believed. Now, I didn't know what he believed. I didn't care what he, realistically. I was just trying to get a grade, but realistically. So I saw, number one, I saw that this guy was sincere. Number two, that faith, whatever that was, changed him somehow. So he was different. He wasn't like every other professor I had. And the funny thing was that that, that belief, whatever that was, that faith, manifested itself and it impacted others because I can prove that because 32 years from now we're talking about it right here. So it made an impact in me in, in some way, shape, or form. So guys, that's what we're going to talk about for just a minute. We're going to talk about miracles and we're going to talk about faith, how that works out. So uh, we're going to get through a couple of definitions before we get rolling, guys. And uh, Theron, if you wouldn't mind. <clears throat> so let's, let's talk about, I'm a scientist during the day, so uh, we tend to like to get our definitions out of the way. So if we can have those, Theron, that'd be great. <clears throat> First of all is a miracle. <clears throat> What's the definition of a miracle? It's a uh, surprising event that occurs. It's surprising and welcome that occurs in the natural, but it has its origins in the supernatural, okay? So... Uh, so a miracle is something that uh, happens to us, but like you getting up late for work and, and, and trying to run and trying to get to work and, and driving real fast, breaking the laws and getting to work on time, that's really not a miracle. That's just you driving fast. <laughs> that's just that's you. So uh, miracle, and let, let's go to faith for a second there. So definitions of faith. So we talked about a miracle. We are going to look at scripture, great scripture today. I'm excited about this from Mark chapter 9. So let's look at the definitions of faith. So these are kind of my definitions. The intellectual faith is a... Uh, a belief or an assurance. Uh, well, let's talk about faith first. So faith it's in and of itself is a, it points to something. So it's a belief that points to something. It has its origin in something and it makes a difference in our lives. Okay. So here's, here's, let's talk about where we're going to talk. Just go over this real quickly. Intellectual faith, as you can see, um, that's faith based on what we know. So, you know, we operate in intellectual faith all the time. You know, it's what you've learned. It's what's going to, you know, you get up in the morning, you expect your car to start, right? If you knew your car wasn't going to start, you would probably make other arrangements. So that would produce an action. So that's faith to a certain extent. In the shower, you know, if you jump in the shower, you're expecting some hot water, hopefully. So uh, all the water hasn't been used. So that's based on our experience. How about emotional faith? <clears throat> so that... Uh, that comes from a little bit different, you know, so emotion, so intellectual faith is kind of where we're at, you know, what we've learned. I use that in my science job. Um, and emotional faith, though, comes from the heart. So, uh, you know, you might have seen a romantic movie or a, maybe you've known somebody dating and you're wondering, why are, they, why are they dating? That's not really working out. And if you ask one of the partners, they would say, well, I just have faith it's going to work out, right? So, unfortunately, that, sometimes that's not really based in intellect, it's emotion, but... Uh, because I want to take a minute and uh, uh, explain a little bit of, I, I saw this in my, my workplace. Now, guys, I'm, a, I'm an analytical chemist by profession, so I work in, with our local utility. And um, we have, a, you know, you, so you think, well, Steve, you're just strictly facts and figures and science. But really, really, it's not true. There is faith built in. I want to take just a minute. I want to explain it a little bit. So I asked Pastor, can we do a little science today with that freak everybody? Yeah. So just relax and have a good time with this. I'm going to explain it. I give these examples when I give tours of our laboratory, and they seem to work. So hopefully we're going to get something out of this. But we're going to relate it to a spiritual matter soon. So so what do we do in analytical chemistry? Uh, would you mind, uh, Theron, showing that? Do you have that? Okay. So what does that look like, y'all? <laughs> Let me put it this way. If, if so if, if needles in a haystack look like that, my last 30 years of my profession would be a lot e easier. But in fact, uh, so what we do in, in analytical chemistry is we use the laws of science and techniques to find needles in a haystack effectively. But Theron, can you move to the next one? We can see that, well, that's really what our, unfortunately, that's more with our haystack. So just imagine a little needle in that haystack. And so how do you, how do you find that? Well, analytical chemistry has an answer. And this is what we do real briefly. So I, I give this example of tour. So 
the first thing we do on a chemical basis is we say, okay, we're not digging through a million pieces of hay, okay? We scientists, we don't got we don't got the we don't got the patience for that. We're going to make the hay invisible. Scientifically, it's interesting. So just imagine that hay disappears, but now you got uh, some needles on the ground, and is that that's really not too easy to find either, right? So what we're going to do on a molecular level, I'm going to show you how this is pretty cool. So bear with me. We're going to wait till it gets dark, and we're going to make the needles shine, because think about that. If you go out there and look at the needle, I mean, they're in the mud and everything, but if it got dark and they shone, if they, if they emitted a light, you could actually find them. You can say one, two, three, four, five, but bing, bada, bada, our job's done, right? Perfect, perfect idea. Well, that's, that's analytical chemistry for you, but uh, our media, what we use actually in the environment is uh, uh, water samples, and if you can uh, show that. So, that, so in, in, our, in our laboratory, we, we're very interested in the quality of water. Um, and again, I work for a local utility, so there's a lot of water being used. Uh, and we're very interested in that. So we're looking for uh, needles in a haystack. So how would you find a little, very small amount of potential contamination that we don't want in our water or in our process for our power plants? How, do you, how would you find it in there? So we're gonna use the same thing. So Theron, if you wouldn't mind, <clears throat> what we're gonna, and uh, so I'm gonna explain just the, uh, for a second, the next slide, please. Um, this is a fire, it's a furnace, and uh, this is a flame that is at 10,000 deg degrees Fahrenheit, believe it or not, guys, at 10,000 degrees. Your normal campfire burns at about 500. You can cook burgers on it, right? But uh, so what I want to explain, so I, had, so I had the opportunity, actually, guys, to bring, a, to bring a chemist into our lab. We took the day off from the lab. I told everybody, I'm going to get you lunch. I'm going to get you breakfast. I'm going to cater everything. You're going to sit down and talk to this guy who is an expert in this particular uh, field of chemistry and they loved it they got free Any, anything having to do with free food is good good for the lab so so this is actually called atomic emission spectrometry if you really got to be true I uh, want to talk about the technical Here, here's what happened so this guy is explaining to us and I want our chemists to really learn about this I have 15 chemists working for me I want them to know the theory and I want them to be good and I give this example uh, when I give tours so basically what we do if you can see that flame and uh, Theron, could you move to the next slide with the atom? So basically, on a molecular level, so bear with me guys for a second here. If you just got a, a, a compound, let's say iron, and it's in water, it's just sitting there like a lump on a log. It doesn't do us any good. It's invisible, you can't see it, can't taste it. But we're gonna do something to that. In fact, if you can go back to that uh, flame, basically what we do is we're gonna spray that water, okay, follow with me, into that flame. And the water obviously doesn't, like the, that flame. So the, the water goes away, we make it invisible. But something happens on a molecular level to the compounds when they get in there. There's a humongous amount of energy there, and uh, Theron, if you could show the atom. So basically what happens is this atom is introduced against its will, so to speak, into a fire, into a flame that has a tremendous amount of energy. And that atom changes. It actually stays the same, but it's different if you can believe it. It absorbs the energy, and it, this is theory, this guy's explaining this theory. It's absorbing this energy, and when it shoots out the end of that flame, it gives off a beam of light. It glows, it shines, literally, guys. I mean, on, on the molecular level is what I'm talking about. So when that light comes out, we have a very sensitive instrument. It detects what type of light it is, and it detects the, the, uh, the brightness of it, so we know exactly what it is, and we know how much is there. Analytical chemistry to rescue, yay, woo! So that's uh, science. So that's about 60 years of technology and, you know, wrapped up into two minutes. <clears throat> but it's uh, very interesting. So guys, so I had this, this applications guy who's a great teacher. We learned a lot from him. And, uh, you know, sometimes I get a little, eh, I, I get a little inquisitive. So, you know, we're talking about the theory and everything. We're two hours into this. And, you know, my science nerds, they're loving it. They get free food and they get to be nerds. So, what, uh, you know, so <laughs> this is great for them. So I asked, I asked this application chemist who is like the leading expert in this, this forum of uh, analytical chemistry. I said, you really don't know that's what happens though, right? And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, we see the light coming out. There's no question about that because we detect it. We analyze it. That's what we use. But on the molecular level, because we don't see what's actually, ha we don't know what's going on in that flame. You're actually making an assumption. And he straightened up a little. <laughs> He's like, and this guy's exactly, and now check this out, this was his response. He points to his heart and he says, 
I have faith that it is true, and I believe that it is true with all my heart. So we're in the middle of a science uh, classroom, academic uh, kind of, and he's pulling out, that's faith, you guys. Is that not faith or what? So just because we don't see it, we don't see the process, we're seeing something coming out the other end, and that something that's coming out the other end could be very useful, guys, very useful, very useful. So you track it with me, guys? So, uh, so let's talk real quickly, guys. There's uh, the intellectual faith we talked about, the emotional faith. So here's a sign. Emotion, you know, I wasn't expecting that. I thought he was going to go back for another two hours. Oh, well, <laughs> it's true, but it was time for lunch. So we, everybody. But guys, what we're going to talk about today is supernatural faith, supernatural faith. So what's supernatural faith? Let's talk about that. It ornate, or originates with God outside of us, okay? It invades our souls in a spiritual format somehow. We're going to see this in our scripture today. It invades our soul. It, it does something different to us. It, it, we're the same, yet we're the, a little bit different. We're different and we're the same. And it produces something that is very useful. In fact, in supernatural faith, and uh, this is uh, kind of our lesson theme for today. <clears throat> and you may see this on Facebook. This is good stuff. So I made this up. When, when we operate in supernatural faith... It will change our lives, number one. We will impact those around us, and we will bring honor and glory to God. So that's what we're talking about, guys, today. We're talking about miracles. We're talking about the faith that honors God. So uh, let's uh, just pray for a moment as we go into our scripture, because really the, the scripture is where the power is, guys. So we're going to get in there. We're going to dig in, and we're going to have a good time together. So let's pray. Lord, we just... I uh, pray you would bless this time of your word, uh, the reading of your word, the study of your word. We know there's power there, Lord. And as we talk about this subject of supernatural faith, um, Lord, we just pray you would, you would change our lives, Lord. You, you would make us different because of this, God. And uh, God, just, just that you would get into our souls, Lord, and, and meet the needs that we uh, have, Lord, today. And Lord, we're going we're gonna to praise you. We're going to thank you. And we're going to just uh, tell you we love you. And we, we thank you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so you have, does everybody have their worship guy, uh, their lesson plan with us? So we're going to be, our lesson theme verse for today comes from Psalm 7714, and that's in your worship guide. You are the God of miracles and wonders. You still demonstrate your awesome power and great awesome. So guys, if you have your Bibles or if you, uh, in your worship guide, you've got the, uh, we're going to be in Mark chapter 9. So you've got the scripture there. And I'm going to go through this just for a minute. I'm going to kind of comment. And then we're going to come back and hit three or four major points. So the context here, we're in Mark chapter 9, is a theological debate. Uh, right before this, you'll see um, there's kind of two groups, actually. It's kind of like the, the religious leaders of uh, Jesus' day. And then we've got the, kind of the new school, the disciples, who are on the scene. They've been given power by Christ uh, to do miracles. And we have this, this man who is in, in a desperate situation with his son. So, so Jesus walks up, and, you know, in this political climate, we've seen some debates, and it's like, la, 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 you know, you know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? So, so we, had the, we had the old school going, well, you didn't do it like we used to do it, and then no new school as well. We like smoke bombs and light shows and all this stuff. So, you know, these kind of debates are here, and, you know, they've been going on for thousands of years, I imagine. Uh, but Jesus walks in and says something very interesting. So he says, what, 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 what you all talk, what are you guys arguing about? And, uh, and a man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit. It has robbed him of his speech. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes at the teeth, becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. So... Here's the picture, guys. So this dad is in a hurting situation. The son has got what probably was thought of a medical condition at first, and we know that it's not. You got to figure he's gone to the doctors. That didn't work. He went to the religious leaders of Jesus' day, which was kind of the context of the argument, so that didn't work. So, I, oh, man, I heard about these new guys. What's going on? So brought to Jesus' disciples. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. So Jesus says something very interesting. You, believe, you unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long should I put up with you? Bring, me, bring the boy to me. So usually, guys, in, you know, admit a serial situation when you're coming to Christ, you say, yes, how can we help you? Can we pray for you? But Jesus comes out pretty strong here, and there's a reason for that. 
And the reason is not so much the miracle, which we are going to talk about for a moment, but it's the faith behind the miracle. So Jesus is actually, I mean, he, he's pretty, uh, you know, he says, uh, you unbelieving gentlile. That's pretty strong stuff there, guys. And he wasn't really talking to, so he's not talking to the dad and the son, the situation he's addressing. Very interesting, though. He's addressing the spiritual climate around him. And uh, he was exasperated. So I think, this is just my opinion, guys, I think he was kind of, a little perturbed at the religious leaders of his day who should know what's going on, and also his disciples that have been with him for a couple of years now, and they're still not quite getting it. Can you picture that? <clears throat> so let's go on. So they brought him to uh, him, and when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw him to the, the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground, rolled around, foaming at the mouth. So this is so, guys, Jesus has identified this. This is a pretty pretty ser serious situation. It is spiritual in nature. And uh, Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? Okay, so, you know, when Jesus asks a question, it's usually not for his, you know, it's not for his benefit as far. So we, there's something we need to know what's going on here. And so here, here's what he says. <clears throat> uh, Jesus asked the boy, how, how long has he been in the lace? From childhood, he answered. And it has often thrown him into the fire or into the water to kill him. But if you can, take pity on us and help us. That's a pretty honest explanation there. So obviously, guys, this guy is very, very serious situation. This, this condition, which was spiritual, was actually trying to uh, take the boy's life. Um, so Jesus has an interesting comment. Uh, it says, uh, if you can, so it's kind of like Jesus says, if you can't, you know, if, I, if you can, everything is possible for one who believes. So again, Jesus is not really going so much after the condition or the boy. He's going to take care of that. But he's more interested, really, in the, in the spiritual condition of what's going on. And immediately the boy father uh, exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Wow, that's, that's incredible. So, so I do believe, but yet I don't believe. We're going to take a look at that, guys, in, in, in detail here as we go. It's a very honest answer. So... Uh, Let's go on and talk about the causes of doubt. So we're going to talk about doubt versus faith here for a moment. <clears throat> so what's a good cause of doubt here? I mean, it, it, just think about it. Uh, you know, back, I can, I can remember in school and lots of, you know, uh, different areas I wasn't too, uh, too interested in that. Mark 9, 19 <clears throat> says, You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? So... Uh, Sometimes we believe because we kind of believe, we, we, we have doubt because we're believing like with the crowd along, you know, uh, we believe it like those around us, as it says in your worship guide. So that's the, that's the fill in the blank there. And, uh, you know, I can remember <clears throat> even, even back in school, um, you know, I, w I was in, I would take pretty big classes and uh, the science was, was hard, but, you know, it was kind of from an evolutionary perspective and, you know, a big bang and all that good stuff. And, I didn't really care. I wasn't, you know, a Christian at that point. But I still thought, you know, that doesn't sound, <laughs> that doesn't really make sense, all this, the earth is this much old and all this stuff. And, uh, I, you know, since I've been a Christian, I've, you know, did a lot of research in that. But, you know, it, 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 you know, sometimes we get caught up with the crowd. So we've got to be careful about that, guys. I mean, especially in uh, academic situations, we can see that. So, um, so the, that guy was uh, kind of believing, uh, you know, what, what, you know, whatever the religious was saying about around him. So he didn't really realize who this Jesus was. So another cause of doubt, <clears throat> we tried things and they didn't work. <clears throat> so, you know, we get, get discouraged when, when, when things aren't happening. Um, if you look at your uh, worship guide, we're in uh, Mark um, uh, 9 and verse uh, 17 and 18. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed. So this guy obviously figured it out that has robbed him of speech, and whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground, it foams, and, and the mouth gnashes its teeth, and he becomes rigid. And I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't. So again, guys, so you, you gotta figure this guy has been exasperated everything. He's been to the doctors. He's been to the religious leaders, disciples, still nothing. Now, I, th I think the issue here might be that I think Sometimes we have a problem with putting God in a box. So we've we got to be careful with that. God operates as he kind of chooses. And he chose in this particular way to work a little differently. So, and that's his right, his sovereignty. So, uh, you know, there may be an issue in our life that really doesn't seem to be changing. But that's not, 
a cause for discouragement either. So we're going to talk about that in just a minute as well. Let's talk about another cause of doubt we believe, sort of. And immediately the boy's father explained, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And uh, uh, also James 1, uh, 6 and 8, if you have that there. But when you ask, uh, you must believe and do not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. And that's James 1 and verse 6, 8. Uh, if, uh, um, Theron, if you could put up the, the picture of uh, my son here. I want to tell you this quick story. It's kind of a neat story. Um, that's my son, Andrew. That was in uh, 2001. He was 11 years old. He looked pretty good, doesn't he? Well, his mama wouldn't let him out, go out the door without the latest Columbia ski wear. <laughs> what it was, though. So this is our, this is our hometown in, uh, in uh, uh, the Litchfield Hills of Connecticut. And this is a ski area. And it's kind of, if you can see, let me get my glasses on so I can... So really, that's the Litchfield Hill. Very beautiful. This is a, like a February time frame. So, and that's the tippity. Do you see that edge right there, guys? That was the edge of the Black Diamond Hill. So this is what happened. So this was a boys' trip. Mama doesn't know this, but she's going to know it now, unfortunately. I don't know if I told her this story exactly. So Andrew's like, come on, Daddy. Come on, Daddy. We got to go skiing. Got to go skiing. I'm like, all right. So got him set up. So the morning, uh, we got there about 8 o'clock, got him set up. The bunny hill, okay, the bunny slopes, you guys. Any skiers? Do we have any skiers? Yeah, skiing is awesome. The rope toe, so I put them on the rope toe. And really, there's only two things you got to know in skiing is how to stop and how to stop. No, there's two ways to stop. So, you know, you, you, know, you snow plow. Everybody do a snow plow, you know. So you bring it in, and that's kind of the rudimentary way to stop. But you really, you really got to need to know how to shift your weight and use your edges of your skis. So. We get up there, and I said, Andrew, snowplow. He's like, Daddy, no problem, snowplow. So he gets up the bunny hill. He goes like this, and a boom, into the feds, no snowplow. You know, he jumps back, and uh, I'm like, okay, this is going to be a long day. I'll teach it Andrew how to ski. So the next run, he actually did it. He snowplowed. He stopped. And then I saw him. We went up to the top of the bunny slope, and it was a little, uh, you know, a little ski lift. And he's, I'm seeing, oh, he's actually turning. You know, he's turning. And he says, Daddy, can we go on the real hill? <laughs> I thought we were going to stay on the bunny slope today, but I'm like, all right, mama's not, mama's not here, so we'll see, what, we'll see how this works out. So, so I took him to the top of the hill, and the top of the hill is a great little ski area in New Hartford, Connecticut. You know, to the, uh, to the right is kind of a nice bunny slope. It really is a mile long, and it kind of winds around the mountain, so that's good. So we started there, and he was, we were jumping, and he was having a good time, and uh, did a couple. This was about two hours now into, into his skiing career. And we get off the ski lift at the top, and, you know, I go towards the bunny slope, and he goes to the black diamonds. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> you know, I tried to grab him, but no. He, uh, so he got not, so I decided to take a picture in case I ever see him again. <laughs> this is what, you know, okay, or if I get home and it's not working out on the home front. So. <clears throat> so two hours into his ski, we're at the top of the black diamond, and he's like this. And I'm like, dude, um, I don't even want to go down there, quite frankly. So he says, see you later, Daddy. <laughs> so he hits the hill. Boom, boom, boom. I mean, there's moguls and stuff. He's hitting, he's down. He gets down there all, you know, one piece. And I'm like, you know, I'm trying to get down. And I, I was like, Andrew, man, what? He's like, come on, let's go do that again. <laughs> so, so, guys, realistically, if you, if you look at the story, how good of a skier was Andrew at the two hours into his career? I mean, realistically, he could, he could buckle, you know, into the, into the ski. He could snowplow. He could pretty much, well, guys, there was something, I mean, his confidence grew, so, and when he, when he hit that black diamond, let me put it this way, y'all, <laughs> you've got to commit to those kind of things. So you, if you don't commit, you're, you're going to be in a world of hurt. So, so what, you know, this is kind of the opposite of, uh, of doubt. He had, he had faith. In, I don't know what he had faith. He just wanted to have fun, but the faith, the doubt was me. I was like, oh, no, I couldn't grab him, you know, and he's flying down there, so that's kind of a cool story there, but, um, uh, and he, Snowboarding, we weren't quite as good at, by the way. That was a little bit more difficult. But uh, so let's go on to a, a faith that honors God, and that's really kind of what we're gonna we're gonna talk about today, guys. <clears throat> so we looked at kind of the causes of doubt, and looked at kind of the type of faith, and um, so the faith that honors God, number one, <clears throat> in your worship guide, it says believes when it doesn't see. Okay. So Hebrews one is also there. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. You know, and King, I kind of, 
in my in our formative years, we kind of grew up uh, King James and Pastor. I know you. That's a great translation. King James says, "Now the faith is the substance of things." Substance. And so I've, I've always loved that word because it's substance is a is a is a tangible. It's a it's a ma- it's matter. It's something real. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And also in your worship guide, you have Matthew nine twenty eight. When he had gone indoors, the blind man came to him and asked him, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And uh, he said, yes, Lord, they replied. So faith is that evidence. You know, one of the biggest proofs that God exists, believe it or not, you know, I've done a lot of being in science, so you can imagine I came to faith, you know, at about 30 years old. My science career was going, and I had been taught all this stuff, and I was like, ooh, you know, what, what, what's going on? So I did quite a bit of research, and I can tell you guys, <laughs> From a scientific perspective, there's no scientific fact that contradicts the Bible. I guarantee you that. There's no scientific fact that contradicts the Word of God. Now, there's lots of theories out there that do, but they're theories. They're theories, okay, guys? We've when when we got to deal with the difference between fact and theory. So faith is the evidence of, of things uh, not It's the One of the biggest proofs is us. So, you know, some of my friends, you know, watching back to Hudson Valley, they say, Steve, uh, why, why are you at church might be, might be the question. And, I, because it's an evidence of God working in me. So and we're going we're gonna to talk about that real, real for, for a, a couple minutes there, guys. So it believes when it doesn't see. Number two, the faith that honors God. It persists when nothing changes. So that's a tough one, guys. Um, you know, in our family, uh, we're, we're, we've got issues that are health-related. Some things don't seem to be moving the way we want to. But what do we do? And... Uh, it's persisted. And, and if you look at uh, uh, Colossians uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 2, <clears throat> be persistent in prayer and keep alert as you pray and give thanks to God. So here's three secrets, guys, I would just want to tell you from this one scripture. Be persistent in prayer. So, guys, we got we to gotta keep after it. We just can't let something, believe me, there's a lot of things that can throw us off track. But we got to be pers- persistent in prayer. You know one of the best ways to do that is? Come to our small group, Kim, at 9 o'clock on Sunday. We pray right here. We pray for you guys. We pray for the needs that come in. Uh, we pray for the service. We pray for you guys. And, man, what a great, I mean, that's, like, that's, a, that's one of the best times of the week for me. I get a lot, I get a lot of done in that half an hour when we pray together. I mean, I just, ooh, a lot of stuff's coming to me then. So we're persistent in prayer. <clears throat> Keep alert as you pray. One of, the, one of the best ways, guys, to, to be persistent is in the context of a small group, which is one of the things I do here, guys. Just, just a good example, guys, is this, is this week when we were preparing for this, we have a special time of worship prepared for you in a couple minutes when we get done with the scripture. And, uh, you know, I was talking to our, our leadership team just a, a little bit ago before the service, and really Pastor Dwayne is my small group leader, and he really, I mean, he ministered to me this week because I was a little bit unsure about, you know, I had a lot going in my mind. It was kind of mushy at this point because we're working on a pretty big project at work. A lot's going on. And uh, he came to me and says, Steve, I mean, he really came in. There. And in the context of a small group, and we, guys, let me put it this way, from a, from a musician standpoint and from a worship kind of leader standpoint, when you got a worship team coming here on Thursday nights and worshiping, and we're about to basically have a church out there. Church starts at 7 o'clock on Thursday. Yeah, so it's awesome, guys. So small group, small group. And this small group is so important. Small groups are so important. And um, so another thing, keep, it, keep in, in a healthy relationship. Keep alert. Keep alert. You know, there, there is a way, you know, there's a way to get distracted so easily in this life. Keep alert, keep alert. And mostly give thanks to God, as it says here. So persist when nothing changes. So a faith that honors God. <clears throat> Look at number three in your worship guide. It works when it doesn't make sense. See, that's... see. For, from a sign, if you're kind of like me, who's kind of wired for you know signs and stuff, you want to make sense out of stuff that doesn't make sense. That's the whole thing. That's our whole thing. Okay, why? You know, every every single day at work, why isn't this working? Okay, we got to make it work. Why isn't it working? So we dig in and we try to figure out. And we use a lot of times our own intelligence. We use our education, and that's great. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But uh, look at uh, look at James too. I love this. <clears throat> you see that as faith. And his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. So there seems to be a relationship. You know, James goes on, he, he really hits this pretty hard. It's a really great, great scripture, James 2. You can't have faith without something happening because of your faith. So 
what James is saying is we don't have faith because of what we do. What we do is because of the faith. Does that make sense? So there's faith. There's faith that works in us. And I'm going to demonstrate, not by telling you I got faith, I'm going to demonstrate by that tangible light, so to speak. We're going to come to that back in a minute. That tangible light of, of Christ living in us, Christ working in us. So it works when it doesn't make sense. And there's a, there's a couple statements uh, <clears throat> here. Uh, faith believes God can. Do you see that in your worship guy? <clears throat> but trusts him even if he doesn't. And that's easy to put up on, on the board there, guys. And uh, there's lots of stories in Scripture about that. I was just thinking on my way over here, the Hebrew children uh, in Daniel's time, uh, standing at the edge of the fire, they would not worship uh, an idol, uh, the king. And, and, and in the book of Daniel, the children say something very interesting. It, you know, they were gonna, the penalty was being thrown into this fire uh, for not obeying the government. And uh, they said, hey, our, li- our God can deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down to you. So, and sure enough, when they were thrown into that fire, man, God showed up. There was a fourth person. I said, and even the people were saying, that looks like the Son of God. Now, how did those people know that was the Son of God? One, two, three kids, and Jesus walking right next to them. So, so that's amazing, guys. So uh, um, I tell you what, guys, you know, we've got about, it's about 1130 now. So um, our time together is drawn to a close, but we're going to have a time of worship or prayer. So this is, what, this is kind of what I'd like to do. Um, if we could go ahead and get the kids uh, back in, and Dwayne, I'm going to have my, my small group just come on up for a second, guys, so just stay in your seats, relax for a minute. We're actually going to have a little bit of time and worship uh, together. So come on up. This is my, I've, I've asked them to come up here for moral support, <laughs> frankly, because uh, it's, been, it's, been it's been a tough, uh, tough message, but I've enjoyed I talk, talk with you, and we're not, not quite through, through yet, yet, so uh, Dwayne's going to uh, play, play a little bit for us, and uh, <clears throat> so if our kids can come on back, and uh, I'm actually going to take the seat, so just relax for a second, guys, because i got a, I got a story to tell. Um, we're talking about the faith that honors God. <clears throat> we're talking about persistence in prayer. We're talking about being in a situation you didn't ask to be in, but you're in. And um, so I'm, I'm going to relate this to you. This was back in 1996, actually, guys. Uh, Dawn and I had uh, just came to faith. We were new, new Christians, so uh, we were loving life. We had a family, um, and uh, Andrew was six years old at the time. And, and in 1996, we got the blessed news that we're going to have another baby. And as the baby was growing in the womb, uh, we turned out it was a girl, and her name would be Elizabeth Ruth. That's it. Elizabeth with an S from... Uh, kind of named after the uh, Old Testament uh, woman of faith in Luke chapter 1. And my mom, Ruth, who re-embraced raised her Christian faith near the end of her life in 1989. That's an amazing story in and of itself, but I don't have time to tell you that. But uh, So here we are. Uh, Dawn is, we're serving the church. I'm in the small groups. I'm a small group leader. Um, I'm preaching, actually, on uh, Sunday afternoons and the nursing home. People getting saved and people coming to faith. It's awesome. And Dawn's working at the church and just a great time. And so it was about this time of a year in October of 1996 that um, Dawn just went to the doctor normal for her checkup, six month checkup. And uh, I got a phone call at work, it was an unusual. You know, Dawn knows not to call me work, it's like a work, I'm like, you know, but uh, when I get a phone call, it's like, really? That's, and she said, Steve, the doctor saw something in my checkup today, and she's not, he, she, my, our doctor's not sure. We've got to go to the specialist, and we need to go right now. So can you meet me downtown in Presbyterian? And um, I'm like, wow, what's, what's going on here? So I drive up there. I leave work, and Dawn's already in the specialist's office. It turns out it's a genetic specialist, and he's got very high-tech equipment. So Elizabeth, again, in six months, you know, is a, is a baby. And you can imagine, guys, you know, proportionally, we were looking at this very high tech ultrasound. So this was the mid-90s, of course. So I don't know what the technology is today, but it was pretty good back then. It was very, very specific. And so, you know, we saw Elizabeth at six months of baby. It was just a little baby, right? Probably about this, this big. And uh, realistically, uh, you know, realistically, if I can, maybe the head was about this big in her, in her body. So she, you know, if I'm, if I'm thinking about the right proportions, so don't hold me to that, then, uh, 
So he says, the doctor, genetic specialist, again, we didn't know this guy, we referred to him on an emergency basis, and he said, come here and I gotta show you this. So he zoomed in, he took the, his computer and he zoomed in on Elizabeth's part of her development uh, head, and it turns out that what we saw, like totally blew us away here. So her little head was about maybe this big or so, but there was a huge cyst about this big, right where, you know, developmental part of the brain so obviously that was like uh, I've never seen anything like that before and so this guy who was a specialist in the in the genetics he he flipped off the monitor and says guys I gotta tell you what this is here and uh, again this guy was one of the best specialists in the in the southeast he says what what the situation is that cyst on a brain is I've seen this and guys it's not good it, it is actually a condition a genetic condition called trisomy 18 I've never heard of that in my life. Biology is not my thing. Basically, he went on to explain. So here's this, we're like shocked. There's like, what is going on? So he brings out these big books and it's all about the science. It's all, it's a chromosomal misalignment of some sort, if you can say that, but it has very dire consequences for a developing baby. Um, it's kind of like picture, picture kind of Down syndrome, but in the train version of that. So you've got a lot of, he said, listen, first of all, these babies, rarely survive the delivery and if your your baby does your the the the, the hand the, the physical challenges are going to be amazing and you guys are uh you know it's going to be very difficult and this is what he said now again guys this was not our doctor um <laughs> so he said uh we have to end this pregnancy right now. This is not going to work out. I'm like, oh, excuse me. <laughs> you know, from a, guys, you can talk about the politics. You can talk about even the science of it. But for us, you know, we were new Christians. We knew that was off the table. Well, I'm just telling you, ending that pregnancy was not an option because we were going to honor God regardless of what. Again, guys. So he says, we need to know right now, because I think I was a little bit suspicious of this because he was pushing us very hard. And I think there might've been a deadline or a legal limit or something going on, but he was like, dead set on this. You gotta do this, you gotta do it right now. So here we are, you know, young couple, um, Christians, we're in this office. So we said, um, we gotta go talk to our doctor who's a Christian, we know Dawn's doctor. We're gonna go talk to her. Lucky he didn't get a hold of water. That I was, I was getting a little, you know, I was it's shocking off. So if I had to do over again, I might have gave him a little bit more peace of my, my mind on that. But um, so guys, here we are. So we had been down, and Dawn was parking in the in the parking lot there, and we met in her car. I just, well, you know, lost it. So here, an hour ago, we were perfectly fine, couple, everything was great, and now we were told we're going to lose our baby, our precious Elizabeth. And how can that be? How can that be, God? Are we not serving here? Are we not faithful? Are we not working in small groups and stuff like that? And so, guys, and this is what happened. We're sitting in that car. Nothing. We got nothing. We absolutely got nothing. We, I mean, our faith is basically, what are we, what are we going to do? And God, that's, guys, that's when God came. Right then, he enveloped that car with his Holy Spirit. He encouraged us. He, it's a supernatural. We started, we were sobbing our heads off. And all of a sudden, now they kind of started drying our eyes dry. And all of a sudden, we were, we were fine. And it was God. It was not us, guys. And God came and he said, in both of our spirits, so here we are, a couple, you know, praying and holding hands. He said, I got this. Just trust me. And that was it. That was, that was the... That was the defining moment. And all of a sudden, we're like, okay, God's got this. Now, how did that, guys, that did not come, that is not us, guys. That is supernatural faith that we're talking about. Faith that honors God. A faith that God gives for a specific time, for a specific reason. So we went back down to her uh, specialist down in Pineville. I said, Dr. 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 She said, no, you know, I, I understand perfectly. You guys are going to go through with this. Not a problem. I encourage you, but there's two things we got to do, very, very, very important things. Number one, I've got to get some doctors ready in that delivery room because, guys, when that when Elizabeth is born, 
we don't know what it's going to be like. Because we said we're not doing any more tests. They want to do all these very dangerous tests on it. And I was like, no, what's, no. So we cut all that stuff off. We're trusting God. We're trusting and believing God. And so she said, that's good. I, I totally agree with you guys. But we're going to have to have some doctors ready in the, in the emergency room. We're going to basically, it's going to be an emergency kind of delivery. He said, and she said, y'all better pray for the next two months. So here we are, guys. Um, pretty good believers again. And to tell you the truth, one of the things that I was probably the weakest in coming, I was pretty good at the Bible coming in and learning theology, you know, but I was not all that great with prayer. And I didn't really understand it. But man, we started praying. We let every single person we know about this Sunday school teachers, Sunday school group leaders. I mean, our passion, missionaries, we had a missionary network we were supporting all over the world. And I had never seen anything like this guy in prayer of the saints, man, were, were lifting us up. And man, we were, we were going to get through in some way, shape, or form. We didn't know how, what was going to happen, right? So it came the fateful day. It was uh, February of 97 now. Gone, heads to the uh, Presbyterian and... Uh, when Andrew was born, we were in the suite, had the jacuzzi tub, had the music playing, had the pictures on the wall of the beach, you know, had the TV and a, and a nice uh, back porch. I mean, it was like better than the hotel that we stay at. And, uh, but we weren't in the birthing suite. We were in upstairs in Presbyterian in the emergency neonatal unit is what it was. And um, here are all these guys, and our doctor did great. She got, she assembled a team was going to deal with whatever we saw. So the birthing in and of itself, that was, it was difficult, and we were going through it, and um, guys that came, <laughs> it was, you know, I'm not much of an operating room kind of guy, I'd rather in the, in the waiting room, you know, handing out the cigars, the old saying, go my dad's generation, that was a little more his, but we were in there, we were hanging in there, we were praying, had our church friends, our small groups were all around, and hey, guys, in a normal birth, like when Andrew was born, uh, you know, the baby's born, and, you know, they do some things, clean up, hand the baby back, and congratulations, you know, and everybody's happy, but this is not what happened. When well, Liz was born, it was very close to the emergency C-section, too, so it was really, real touch and go there. So the doctors, Elizabeth was born, we didn't hear much, I was, we weren't really looking, it was pretty well, you know, so they clean, and then, so they had all these carts, so they put, they took Elizabeth up, Wrapped her up, we didn't see her, put her in this cart, and boom, they took off. Right across the hall to the emergency room. So we were kind of alone. It was kind of a little bit awkward. It's like, you know, so you know, normally that's a that's a happy, that's a joyous time, but um, so we were just praying and and uh, so about there was a beehive activity there. In fact, they, they went out so fast a bunch of stuff fell off and all, all this all these like instruments and you know, all these you know instruments for the birth fell off and they were just like they they were just in a in a supreme you know emergency mode in a triage mode and um, so about five minutes passed we didn't hear anything we didn't hear anything and one thing guys when we got to the hospital our head nurse she comes and says we're gonna pray this baby out she was a Christian. And so this head nurse was really handling all this stuff. She was, she was, she would take care of business. She was praying for us, and she was kind of running the show. And uh, and she said, "Man, we're gonna we're gonna do what you can, we can for a baby Elizabeth." So they went flying out of there. They were doing her things. About really, it seemed like a long time. But five minutes later, here comes the head nurse, Elizabeth, in her arms, a little hat on her. Handing it to mom and saying, Congratulations on your wonderful, normal, perfectly healthy baby girl. <laughs> so, guys, um, <clears throat> if you can, that was on the, so that's baby Elizabeth in February of 1997. That's that's a look of a mama. It's happy. And of course, actually, Elizabeth is here with us today. She's not only a beautiful baby, but a world-class beauty and a beautiful spirit, beautiful girl. And um, so think about this, guys, for a second. As we, as we talk about, we're talking about the process of faith, how God works in supernatural, in a miracle here, 
can't be explained by science. It's God coming and giving faith. So here, here's, I think about this, guys. So here we were, minding our own business, if I can really just do our analogy, and I'm going to try to bring this to a close, guys. So here we were, just minding our own business, just kind of doing our thing, and we were put into a situation that we didn't ask for, against our, our will, in effect, and it was an extreme situation. It was the fire. If you remember that picture, it was the fire. But something happened during that fire, and God supernaturally came and injected faith, and somehow gave us faith. How can, we have, how can you have faith in that circumstance? You're going to lose your faith. He said, I got this, I got this. And that faith produced something in us, right? Which was the action of trust. He said, I got this, I got this. And God came through in his word. God, let me put it this way. As a new Christian, three years in the faith, it's three things I learned real quick. I don't doubt the power of prayer anymore, guys. Unbelievable. God. The prayer network that went into that was incredible. I don't doubt, I don't doubt at all God's word and his power and his faithfulness. To deliver. Yes. He told us he would. I didn't know how. He could have gone lots of different ways, but he did. He did. He did. And guys, here's another thing. We're talking about that light. We talked about that in a small group. We talked about even in the chemistry example of how that light shines. But guys, I'm telling you, Dawn has used this experience to minister to a lot of people. And her prayer ministry, and even right now, I'm using this example to hopefully build faith in you guys and say, hey, this God is real. This God is it means what he says, and his word is true, and his word is powerful. So, so guys, I'd like to, I kind of feel like almost worshiping right now, and so this is a great story. So I've asked, that's kind of why I asked my small group is moral support stuff, and Miss Laura is going to sing us a wonderful song. So guys, what I would like to do, if you want to, uh, it's just family here, and if you're comfortable with that, that's great. I don't want to say to when we start the song, we're going to worship together. The song is going to be up on, it's called Set My Heart. And this song, I was just telling the leadership a little while ago. Man, this song is ministered to me. It's ministered to our team. It is just, it's just really, God has been using it. So if you, you know, actually, you know, come on, if you want to come forward a little bit, actually just come on. And I'm going to get on my guitar in a minute. But if you guys just want to come on up to this area, and if you guys want to worship, that's great. If not, that's great. But it's come on up, and we're going to sing this song. And so, Lord, would you mind there? Thank you very much. Come on in, guys. Let's worship together. And after this, we're going to have a, a brief time of prayer. So just come on in. Let's worship.
trusting you. We're trusting you in that pain. Father God, we're trusting you with our hearts of glory and anxiety, Lord Jesus. In life, we're dealt so many tough things, Lord Jesus, but we're trusting in you. We're having that blind faith, Father God, that you will work in the good and that you will fry in our fire, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, guys. We're just going to do one more thing and pray just a minute. So, guys, in an opportunity like this when the Lord is here, we've got to, we've got to take advantage of these type of uh, situations, guys. It's a great atmosphere of worship. God is here. So, God, we're going to do something a little different. I'm just going to ask for it. We're going to have a time of kind of uh, prayer among the congregation. So, I really want to kind of focus on three types of prayer today because I think, I think God will be honored by that. First of all, for salvation, guys. If you're here and you don't know Christ, this is a great day, so we're going to ask uh, uh, our prayer team is going to be here. If you if you want to come on up and, and talk to a prayer, and they'd be happy to tell you how, how you can know for sure that you're going to heaven. In fact, guys, I mean, think, think about that. 1993, God came, revolutionized our life, and it was because somebody faithfully, just like this, said, Jesus is the Son of God. He died on the cross for our sins. And those sins that we have were transferred to Jesus. He was the substitutionary uh, death. And he paid that price because he loved us. <laughs> and when he rose from, from the grave, guys, on that third day, he proved who he was. And God says, if you place your faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, you believe. We've been talking about supernatural faith. Ask God for that supernatural faith. If we can't do that on our own, we don't wake up and say, yeah, I think I'll be a Christian. That's not how it works, guys. That faith is given by God for a specific purpose. And what happens when that kind of faith comes, saving faith, we repent. It's very interesting. So our faith causes us to say, oh, you know, that, like, believe me, there was a lot in my life, and I went like this, Lord, you just tell me from now on, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to set my heart on you. And that's Bible salvation. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, for by grace you are saved through faith. So that God's grace, his love for us, is the kind of the mechanism, and faith is used to tell us that that's true, that Jesus is who he said he was. And if we believe that he uh, died for our sins and, and rose from the grave on the third day, we call upon his name. God says, that's what I want to see. That's saving faith, guys. That's Bible faith right there. So, guys, if that's your circumstances, guys, we're not going to point anybody out. Like a pastor or something, we can help you with that. We'd love to pray with you for that. There's something else in the circumstance, guys, that I was just impressed upon. There may be some individual needs. So I'd like to do a little bit of individual prayer. So if you have a prayer need in just a minute, it could be physical, it could be relational. Find the prayer. We've got Kim and everybody. Find, find one of our prayer partners. They would like to, and pastor is actually going to help with this too. The biblical, apostolic, New Testament prayer, which we're supposed to be doing, is laying hands on people, anointing with oil. And that's one of the mechanisms God used to bring faith and to bring healing. Finally, guys, if you're like me, uh, I've got a lot of friends, I mean, just all over the place who, you know, I would like to talk to about faith and also, but, so let's pray for our friends and our family who maybe need a faith of their own. And so we're going to pray in that. So this is kind of what I'd like to do, guys. Uh, Miss Dana, as the Grips agree, to sing just one more song, guys, and the pastor's going to close us out. As we sing, I'm just going to come down, and if you have any kind of prayer, need, if this altar is open, guys, so if you want to spread out here, if you want to find one of our prayer team members, please do that, and tell them, hey, what kind of, you know, hey, I really need, I need a touch from God. I need to be saved. I want to know I'm going to heaven when I die. We can help you with that. And if there is a friend or a loved one that's on your heart, let's let's get on the altar for these folks, guys. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray these people into heaven. There was to tell you the truth, guys, there was only one Christian I knew who prayed us into heaven. That was Dawn's grandmother. She faithfully prayed for years and years. And here I am. And that's the effectual, fervor prayer of the righteous, guys. That's, that's what that's that's Bible praying right here, guys. So we're gonna do a little little church today. So I'm just gonna lead if you guys can go ahead and so I'm gonna come down. And if there's any prayer needs, please feel free to use it. The pastor, come see Pastor Kim. And also, and, and Dawn's here as well. If you want, Oh my God, this, let me put when Dawn prays, stuff happens also. Oh, come on, come on, come on and see Dawn. We've got a special gift of prayer. So, guys, I thank you for this. Let's have a moment of prayer together. And Wayne and Dan, you guys take it, and the pastor's going to come and uh, close the service. So, let's pray. Let it be 
committing and surrendering all to Him. Just coming to that point of faith, declaring that faith in the Lord. And I want to tell you, when you do, there's going to be a change. There's going to be something produced in your life. You'll never be the same. You're going to encounter life as it was always intended to be. And your life's going to get better. Even when things are happening crazy around you, life's still better. It's because there's Jesus. So if that's you today, and you say, Pastor, did you lead that prayer? Would you count me in that prayer? Would you have the boldness right now? My head's about it, eyes are closed. I'm going to call you just, I'm just going to let you pray right where you are, just between you and the Lord. But that's you. Say, Pastor, when you pray that prayer, would you count me in? Would you just lift up a hand boldly? Lift it right now. God bless you today. Anyone else? Amen. God bless you. Yes. Yes. Right? Just simply from your heart, just mean it. Just mean it. Come on, just say this. Say, Jesus, today I put my faith in you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. For paying my debt so I wouldn't have to. Thank you for that free gift of life that you offer to me today. By faith, I accept that. I accept your payment for me in full. So today I surrender my life to you. Come on, put it this way. Say, I give you my life. And with all of my heart, as you enable me to, I will follow you all the days of my life. Lord, I thank you for those that have made the best decision of their life. Lord, I thank you for those that have declared you as Lord by accepting you by faith. And Lord, I pray the days follow to be the best days of their life. Because you're with them. They're not alone. And in all circumstances of life, we can trust you, Lord. Thank you for the overcoming principle that, that, that overcomes the world. And that's the principle of faith in you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for your word today. We just give you praise and we give you honor for all you've accomplished in the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. Come on, let's celebrate James' lives today. Come on.